so we are going to dig into God's Word together this morning. Anybody excited about that? Oh, okay. Amen. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Jesus actually preached a sermon when he was here on earth. Well. And it was a quite a long sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. As you read through Matthew, it's chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. If I've calculated it correctly, it was kind of like a 20-part sermon. So this was a long sermon, which tells you that that first church was definitely not American. And it definitely wasn't white American because they wouldn't have sat through its church service that long. Okay, let's just be honest. So he had this 20-point sermon. Well, today I'm just going to cover two of those points, two of those areas, okay? So some of you are like, I got plans, I'm going out to eat, we won't be here that long, but there's so much here in this Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is kind of laying out this this kingdom manifesto. He's telling them, this is what I'm bringing down from heaven to earth. This is what the kingdom of God is to look like. This is how you are to live. This is what you are to be like. We, we spent a whole sermon series just on one portion, the Beatitudes, a couple years back. Well, there's so much here, but in the middle of that message, in the middle of his teaching, in chapter 6, he, he gets to two areas that to me deal with potential distractions from us being fully devoted to Jesus. From us living as the diligent disciples that we've been talking about, saying we're, we're trying to live, you know, with the intensity of following Jesus. Well, there's a whole list of things we could come up with, but Jesus pointed out in this part of the passage, in this part of his teaching, that there's two things that are pretty closely related that can often take our hearts away from being fully devoted. So, what are those things? Well, if you go to Verse 19 in Matthew chapter 6, you're going to see that first he's dealing with greed, the love of money, wanting things, possessions, riches, wealth, all those material things that we desire here on earth during our lives. And we know that that is a serious thing for our culture and our society. Everywhere you go, whether you're on social media or whether you're watching television or even reading something in print, what are we hit with? Advertising, right? Somebody trying to tell you something, sell you something that you want this, you need this, you got to have this. Look, look who's got this. Don't you want this? You got to do better. You got to get more. You got to look nicer. You got to smell better. You got to all of this stuff. All of that, it's, it's not about us communicating. It's not about even about us being entertained. They want our attention to try to convince us that we need more. They want to play into that greed that's in our selfish desire that's wanting to consume things, wanting to get more things. And it's almost like there's a belief that if we get more things, we're going to be happier we're going to be more fulfilled, right? You get more status, you're going to feel better about yourself. You have more possessions, life's going to be more comfortable. Things, things, life's going to be better. I can have more happiness, I can have more peace. Let me, let me give you an option, and I don't think this is going to be a very hard choice. But let's just say, I'm kind of feeling like Oprah today, and I'm going to give everybody that's here a brand new house. You get a house, you get a house, even in the balcony, you get a house. Yeah, okay, some of y'all are awake now. Brand new house. And I'm going to let you choose what you want that house to look like. On the outside, on the inside, you get, you get to choose custom-made house from the ground up. To your liking. All the extras you want, you know, whatever cushy chairs you want. You can get a 300-inch screen TV, whatever you want in that house. Okay, your choice. Now, there's two options. You can have that house in, in this area, where you, wherever you currently live, whether it's North Chicago, Waukegan, Gurney, Skokie, Kenosha, where, you can have your house there, 
Okay, that's part of option A. Or you can have your house in option B, which is whatever your dream retirement destination is. The Bahamas, Hawaii, Florida, South Africa, Italy, France, wherever you want to spend retirement, right? Your dream place. Now, that's, there's two options of location. Same house, similar. Now, there's also two other differences. You can either have this house in your current location the way you want it for just a few months this summer. Now, you've got to put it in a little work. You've got to do some of you know, you don't have to do it all, but you've got to do part of it. But you can have it for three months. Or you can have this house wherever you want it to be for the rest of your life. Now, you may have to wait a little longer to get it. It may take a little more work to get there, a little more patience. But you're going to get it, and you're going to have it for the rest of your life. I think it's kind of a rhetorical question, right? Which would you choose? You don't want all of that dream house just for three months. You want it for the rest of your life. Well, Jesus speaks to that. Let's read verse 19 and 20 in chapter 6 of Matthew. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. See, we oftentimes find ourselves consumed with trying to live a life for a three-month summer home. For a temporary location, we're putting all of our effort, all of our devotion, trying to build this dream house that's just going to be here for a little bit. And then it's going to rust and it's going to be broken into and it's going to be destroyed and things are going to attack it. And eventually at the end of that summer, there's going to be some storm that comes through and wipes that out. And man, you just had a real nice few months in this nice house that you poured everything you had into because that was a temporary focus. Versus him saying, build up your treasures in heaven that will not only last the rest of your physical life, but it will last the rest of eternity. You will get to be in beauty, in perfection, in, in having everything that you ever wanted or needed. Why do we spend our time focused on temporary treasures? What we can get on earth while we're here. You, I don't know if any of you remember uh, Minister Daniel one time and others have used a similar example. that The long rope, right? And it was that one little piece of tape on the end of a long rope. That's like our life compared to eternity. He, he's trying to start by challenging them about their priorities. Where are you trying to gain your treasures? On earth? Or in heaven for eternity. And he also says, look, it's not just a priority issue, but it's actually a heart issue. Look at verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So notice the the sequence of that. The treasure, the possessions, the things you're going after, the things that are consuming you, the things that have the highest priority, those things that you really want and desire, not what you might say in like a Sunday school answer, but what you're really living for, those treasures are having the greatest influence and they're impacting your heart. Notice it didn't go the other way. Notice it didn't say, well, get your heart right and then you'll end up finding good treasures. So in essence, those those things have more influence on dictating where your heart is, what what you're longing for, because that's where your priority gets focused. So he's saying, look, this is a heart issue. And what does Jesus want? He wants your whole heart. He wants all of your devotion. He wants all of, of your priority. He wants you to long for him and his things, to, to, to go after his treasures, the, the true riches that he's offering to us. He wants our whole heart. But here's the thing, if it's not all his, then it's not at all his. You have to give him all of it. That's what he's asking for, to, to choose him, to make his 
ways and his truth your priority. And then it gets to beyond a priority issue and a focus issue. Excuse me, a heart issue. It gets to a focus issue. Look at 22 and 23. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now here's the thing. He's, he's asking us to consider what, what are we focusing on? What, what are we looking at? What are we prioritizing? Because that's going to determine what gets, what's in us. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not expecting any amens on this section, and y'all are really quiet because we're talking about the truth that some of us, we really prioritize these things. We like money. We like things. So it's okay. I'm just going to keep challenging us because in my Bible, these, these are red letters. That means Jesus said this. So you ain't mad at me. You mad at Jesus. I'm okay. I'm just repeating. Don't hate the repeater. Okay? So the eye is the lamb. Now let me, let me help you because I don't know if your Bible helps you with this, but the Greek word for healthy is generous. So if you are looking at being generous, that's spiritual health. To be generous. He's contrasting that with gain all this stuff for yourself. No, if you want to have a focus, focus on being generous. That's the light. That's Jesus light coming through. So as you're generous, as you open your eyes, light from Jesus, the truth comes in. And now you're full of light because you're full of him because you're living like him and you're seeing like him. You're seeing others in need and you're generous. The opposite is unhealthy. That's a word in Greek that means stingy. Keep it to yourself. Selfish. Let me pile up what I have and, and hoard it over here. I, I've, I'm good. I got what I need, but I'm not sharing it. I'm not being generous. So if my eyes are closed, I'm closed up because I'm stingy. I'm keeping within. There's no light of God's truth getting in. And so I'm living on the darkness on the inside. So generosity opens us up to receive more of God's truth. Just like giving opens you up to receive more of God's blessing so you can give it again. But if you hold on to what you have, you're closed up. You can't receive like this. You can't receive light and truth. You're always walking in darkness because your eyes are closed. You're stingy and not generous. You see what he's saying here. That's why you're not saying amen. You're just thinking about it. I hear you. I see you. I, I, can, I can feel the spirit convicting. It's okay. So how we steward or manage things, possessions, material things, riches, wealth, whether we have a little or a lot, how we manage those possessions is a significant indicator of our spiritual health. That's why some have said, you know, back in the day when we used to have checkbooks, right? Show, show me your checkbook and I'll show me, it'll show me how committed you are to the Lord. How much you give, how generous you are, how you manage what God has given you, how you use it. Because see, it's a devotion issue. Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And really that word is even more than money. It, possessions, those things you own, that, that man and night, that all of those things that you have. You can't serve those things and serve God. You don't need a whole lot of English to understand. Cannot mean you cannot. It's impossible. You, now we try. And in, in American Christianity, we try to, we've kind of tried to sort of ride this line of, of truly trying to serve God and still really liking our stuff and wanting more of it and then saying we, we love God. But he's saying, no, you, you, you can't love. You have to love one and hate the other. And by that, it means that other thing is of so far less value that I don't even care about it. You can take it away, but what's important, what I love is one or the other. Which 
one are we choosing? Which one are we serving? Which one is mastering us? Which one gets our time, our attention, our thoughts, our effort, our work, our obedience, our diligence? God or money? God or things? God or this, that, or the? Make a list. You cannot serve both. It's one or the other. So that's the first point. Greed. Materialism. Putting the physical ahead of the spiritual. And then... What I think of as greed's cousin, worry. Worry. See, greed is you can never get enough. And worry is afraid you'll never have enough. Greed is you can never get enough. And worry is afraid you'll never have enough. And in all these instances, you can have a whole lot or have just a little. You can be super broke or super rich. And you can still be greedy and you can still have worry. And so now he's challenging them, look... I'm not just saying don't go after those things. I want to deal with how are you managing your emotions? How are you managing how you trust me? How are you navigating whether you have a lot or a little? And so instead of getting to all the the bigger things, he just brings it back to let's talk about the basic needs, the basic things of life. Look at verse 25. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, Or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is life not is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. So he brings this down to the real sort of practical reality. Let's just talk about what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're wearing, like that that those basic needs that everyone has, whether you were living then or you're living now, whether you live in America or you live in in Asia or you live in the North Pole, you you have basic needs to feed your body, to provide source of substance in in, in drinking, to, to, to put something on your body, to... Wear clothes to have these basics of life. Now, he's not saying you shouldn't ever think about it or have a plan. You have to figure out, you know, does this, do these clothes fit? And I have to make a choice about what I'm going to eat. And he's not saying you never have a thought or never have a plan or that you don't even work for it in some ways. But he's saying, he says five times from verse 25 to 34 in some variation, do not worry. Do not worry. Why are you worrying? Don't worry. Why, do you, why are you worried about these things? See, worrying is, is over-anxious, over-stressed, overly concerned, caught up and distracted from what's true and what's important. You're, you're caring too much about these things. You're putting too much emphasis. It's, it's influencing all of your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions because you're too concerned. You're too caught up with worrying about even these basic things. But how many of us know that that can be true? I know it can be true. I'm thinking about sending a second child to college, and that's a whole lot of money. And if I'm honest, sometimes I catch myself getting stressed and not trusting God. That's real, right? You have have bills to pay. We have choices to eat. And I I know people who literally have nothing, and I I take them to the food pantry. It's like you're, you're wanting to have something to eat. Like, those are legit concerns, but... When it moves past a, a, a concern in a practical way to making me anxious, making me stressed, I'm waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm afraid, I'm, 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 I'm overthinking, right? All these things that start to happen because we want to, to be the way we want it to be. And it isn't always like that way. Now, Jesus, he's clearly making his main point in this section from 25 to 34. His main point is do not worry. He says it five times. It's not complicated. And oftentimes when Jesus teaches, even when you look through the scriptures, when you study, when you study them, you can find in a section there's a main point. And then he'll build sort of arguments around that to support what he's trying to say. And if you read through these verses, you'll see actually several arguments that Jesus is making that, that support and validate his main point, do not worry. I'm not even going to go through all of them, but I want us to look at a few of these, these arguments, this, this, the support that he's making, because this is where we spend time thinking about, okay, what does that mean for me? How do I apply that to, that to my life? Because he's challenging me, too, today to do not worry about these things. So Jesus uses the truth. 
Because the truth should override the emotion. Anxiety, worry is an emotion. But what the purpose of truth is, is to give us clarity to move through the emotion to be able to rest on truth. So his truth to us is, you do not have to worry. So we've got to figure out how we work through all of our feelings that get us worrying to get back to the truth that we don't have to worry. And why is that true? Well, let's look at these things. The first one, in verse, starting in verse 26, he's basically telling us that he, as our Father, provides for those that he values. God provides for those that he values. And he uses a, a, a simple example. He starts with the birds. Look at in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? He's saying these birds, they live day to day. Now, they do some work. So even in worrying, God is not saying that we just sit back and open our mouths and hope that God is going to drop worms from heaven to feed us. They do some work, so they have a part to play, but they don't have complete control. They have to work with what's in their reality. And ultimately, they didn't create worms. They didn't make them, right? They have to, God provides them in some way, shape, or form to, to give them what they need, even just the simple answer of birds, at least the adult ones, right, that are supposed to be more mature, right? They're, they're being provided for. So the challenge to us is that, yes, we do work, but we're not fully in control. Now, we don't like to hear that. Because oftentimes we act like and live like, like we can gain full control over our lives. That we are the source of everything, right? We have, we have control issues. We want it to be our way when we want it. We want to have enough piled up so that if it's, you know, something happens, I, I know I'm safe and secure. I can go pull from that fund and I've got this and I've got a, you know, a backup car if this one breaks. I got a backup job if I lose this one. I got a backup spouse. No, maybe not that one. We like to be in control of the situations because we don't want to be without. But that's not what he's saying. You're not supposed to act like your own source. I'm providing. And then he gives another example, another practical example from creation. Look at verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? He's taking care of the birds. He dresses the flowers even more beautifully than we can possibly dress as people. And he's saying, look, there's two things. Go back to what he said in verse 26 at the end. It says, are you not much more valuable than they? See, I think part of our problem is we must not understand our value. Maybe we don't understand how much God loves us, how much he cares for us, how he sees us. Because if it's either we're not trusting him because we don't think we're valuable enough, or we don't think... He's able to provide. I mean, that's, that, those are your options. If you're worrying, if you're stressed, either, either, either you're not good enough for God to take care of you, or He's not good enough to take care of you. Those are the choices. Because if He's good enough, then I'm good. And if I'm good enough, He cares about me, well, then I don't have to worry. I got the, the greatest Father ever. Perfect. Never messed up. Who's taking care of me? That's his point. Consider your value. I'm your daddy. I love you. I, I, I take care of all my creation, even the, the grass. It's going to get just thrown out and blown and set on fire. It's, it's so temporary. It, it, it's beautiful. It's special. But it has so little value compared to you. And I take care of that. Even those birds. You don't, you don't see birds with hair falling out because they've been stressed. You don't see the birds going from one tree to the other tree where they've got a, you know, a counseling appointment because the bird is stressed. 
He just finds a worm and goes back and feeds his kid and keeps singing. It's good. Life's good. It's just the birds, and, and they're beautiful, most of them. My God. But what is it? Well, if it's not a value issue, then maybe it's a faith issue. He says, you of little faith, do you trust me? Son, daughter, how many times do I got to provide for you? How many times do I have to take care of you? You're worried because you don't like the options of 40 shirts that you have in your closet and so you get all stressed out or you know you don't you, you you you're making this dollar an hour instead of that dollar an hour and he's like do you know some people are broke and homeless and in poverty and and you're tripping and stressed because you only had one choice of meat for dinner i've already taken care of you you just don't see it why don't you just trust me Why don't you just trust me? We read this morning in our time of prayer at 8 a.m. from Psalm 46. In verse 10, it says, be still and know that I am God. And the still is not just shut up, although sometimes it's that. But it's stop moving in opposition and let go and surrender. All of these things you're trying to carry and manage and control, God is saying, let them go. Surrender that to me. I've got you. I'll provide even for the base, the most basic things. I, I can provide for anything that you need. Not just what you want, because that's where we get mixed up. We think we, we've got a different translation that says God shall provide all our wants. You find that, come back and show me and make sure it's not the USA version of the Bible that somebody made up. I'm not saying you're going to just get the, the Cadillac you want or to get the you know, five-story house that you want. I'm saying he's going to take care of what you really need. And he's going to give you love and peace and joy and all that that can't be measured and is better than any possession you could ever find. That's what he's going to give you. Now, I love it because sometimes Jesus is just kind of like to the point like, I know he wouldn't say it like this, but it's almost like, are you an idiot? <laughs> Like, come on now. Like, look at verse 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Like, dude, what's the point? What does worrying do for you? Well, I've gained a little more time so that maybe this thing will happen. No, you don't gain any time from worrying. You you can't worry so hard that poof, it's going to happen. It does nothing of value. It does not benefit you. It's worthless. Worrying does nothing for you except impact your physical body. You got ulcers. You know, you can have your brain is impacted by how much you worry, your heart, all of your organs, your body. You can gain weight from worrying. Some of us can say amen to that. You, You are impacted in a negative way. There's no positive benefit that comes from worrying. You can't add nothing to your life. Why are you doing it? That was what Jesus said. And then he says, let me challenge you even more. Look at verse 32. Actually, let's start in 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Verse 32. For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Pagans is just another word for those who don't believe God. They got their own God. They're going after their own thing. So what he's saying is the characteristic, the lifestyle of unbelievers is to worry. So if we're living a lifestyle of worry, then how do people know we're a believer? How do they see a difference in us if we're living with the same stress and anxiety that the unbelievers are? That those who don't know God are, are figuring life out and going after accumulating and, and piling up and trying to control and, and trying to think of themselves as their own source, depending on themselves versus believers who are supposed to be set apart to be different that say, we are people that trust God. Right. We are people that when, when all else fails, God's going to show up. Yeah. When our backs are against the ocean, somehow God's going to part it and we're going to walk through it and not get wet somehow our god is going to make a way out of no way i'm going to be taken care of now i might not have everything i want my life is not perfect i'm i'm not without challenge we're going to go through some stuff but when we do 
I'm going to let go and somehow God's going to find some worm to put in my mouth because he's going to take care of me physically, emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually. That's my God. But what are people seeing? What testimony are we giving? What is your level of worry and anxiety communicate to those around you? To your classmates, to your co-workers, to your friends, to your family that may or may not know Jesus. What, what do they see in you? What are you pointing them towards? It says that he knows that you need them. God knows what we need. He knows what we need. We don't even have to tell him. Now, it's good when we pray. It shows we're being more intentional to say, God, I depend on you. But he already knows. He already knows you're coming to him in need of. He just he wants us to recognize that he's the provider. He's the source. He's the one that is able to take care of us. And stop trying to do it ourselves. Stop trying to figure out everything and get caught up. You can't be fully devoted to following Jesus if you're so consumed with trying to figure out how you're going to go follow and get everything else. I mean, it's not that complicated. It's hard. It is because it takes faith. It takes us trusting him. Well, here's another thing I like about Jesus. He always has a good way of sort of like showing them, well, here, let, let me help you. Because he knows we're kind of slow. We're kind of stubborn. We, we get off track just like the disciples did over and over. We do the same thing. And he said, okay, well, let me, let me kind of try to make this plain for you. Let me try to make this plain. Look at verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Let's just stop right there. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All right, let's break this down just for a minute. It's his kingdom. So just by simple interpretation, he's the king. He sets the rules. He sets the ways. He has the authority. He's in control. He's sovereign. It's his rules. It's his book. It's his truth. It's Whatever he says, he's the king. Oh, and he, so so when, when Jesus came, he said, I'm just doing the Father's will. We're bringing the kingdom of heaven as the king laid it out, and we're bringing it to earth so that earth should be moving towards operating under this kingdom authority that he established in his ways and his justice and his righteousness and his truth, his love. His peace, not any other manufactured version that we try to come up with. It's his ways. It's his kingdom. It's also his righteousness. He's right. Anything that doesn't line up with that, it ain't right. Any other opinion you have, you can have it, but it's wrong. He's right. And for us to be right, with him, we need to be in right relationship as the right one says is right, if you can be with me. So he's got a way to make us right. And that way came through Jesus, who surrendered his life and asked us to then in turn, not by death on a cross, but by willing choice, surrender our own life. You're right, God. I'm not. I've been doing it my own way. I've been working on this little three-month temporary house, trying to make it look good on the outside. I'm trying to enjoy temporary life, and I realize that's wrong, and so I'm going to turn the other way. I'm going to repent, and I'm going to say, Lord, you are right. I've been wrong this whole time, and I admit it. I need you. And he says, that's all I'm asking. Believe me, recognize you were wrong, and trust me that I'm right. And now you get the big house forever. And I'm not only that, I'm going to be with you while you're still here on earth. But you have to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So our response is to seek, to desire to go after, to pursue, to go dig like there's a treasure buried in the, in the ground somewhere and I'm selling everything I have to go find it, to, to look for that pearl of great value, that, to find that, that thing, to go 
after with everything I have to seek. To seek, and not just to seek, but to seek first. It's got the highest priority. It's of chief importance. It has the greatest value. I'm going after that which is more important than anything else. I'm seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness. I don't have my own kingdom. I don't have my own righteousness. But some of us act like that's what we're seeking first. Now, I want to help us understand, this is just me giving a a little bit of a visual demonstration on the slides of what seeking first looks like. So go ahead and go to the next one. So I think a lot of times we think, okay, on the left is maybe the like, I ain't really got it all together priorities. Now, some of you would admit kind of that's your list if you're honest, but you might not say that in church today. Okay, you got a priority from one Maybe it's money, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your hobbies, whatever that is, right? You can make your own list, one through whatever. Now, sometimes we think, okay, I just need to get God first. And I want to show you that that's actually incomplete. That you're, you're not just called to reorder your life where, okay, God is first. Whatever that looks like. Well, you know, I prayed first thing in the morning, so God is first, right? I went to church the first day of the week, so God is first. I don't know what that means, okay? That, that's, that's better on the right. God at number one on your list is better, but that's not the best. Let's go to the next slide. See, seeking first God's kingdom means that in every area, in every aspect, in every category of your life, that God is first. So... Go back one. Don't get ahead of me. Thank you, sir. In your family, how you manage your family, how you live in your family, how you love your family is dictated by what God says. And it goes first to glorify Him. So everything about what God wants for my family, that's what I'm seeking first. And let's pick another category. In my relationships with other people, how I love them, how I forgive them, how I'm gracious and merciful with them, how I'm kind to them, I'm doing it based on seeking God first. Okay, so my money, oh, help us. With my money, I'm seeking God first. So it's God's money first. You've given it to me. How do you want me to use it? Where do you want me to give? Okay, God, here's the first fruits, but what about the second and third fruits? How do I be generous and not stingy? How do I honor God with what I have? How do I trust Him to provide? How do I, how do I manage the, the debt that I have that He didn't want me to have? God, how do I seek you first in this area? With my work, with my talents, with my time, with my giftings, with my abilities, how do I use them first for God's kingdom and His righteousness? Not for my own selfish gain, not for more followers or more likes or 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 more influence or more status, not to feel better about myself. But God, how do I use this? How do I teach for your glory? How do I sing for your glory? How do I serve for your glory? How do I how do I you know manage this accountant job for your glory? How do I work at AV for your glory? I seek you first. Wherever, time, treasure, talents, all of it is through the filter of seeking God first. So it's not just trying to put God into a list. It's everything I have going through that filter of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. So nothing in my life gets moved elsewhere because I've got one master. I've got one king. So he gets to speak into every area of my life. Now, if you don't want this, you don't want to be a disciple. And that's okay. Because you got a choice. But let's not act like following Jesus and being his disciple means that we can seek him first in this area, but not in the other areas. And I'm not saying we don't fall and we're not weak because we struggle, but if we're not devoted and committed to that, then we are not fully serving God. We're not fully seeking Him first. And seeking Him third, fourth, or fifth just won't do. That's the call. Hey, I wish it were easier myself. God, as long as I give you 20 minutes a day, then my life would be perfect. Oh, sometimes I selfishly wish that were the formula. Because I can be greedy, I can worry, I can want things myself, but actually, 
what I've come to know and as I've grown and matured is that as I seek him first, life is better. I'm not saying it's always easier, but there's something that changes. I've got a peace that I never had before. I don't have to live in the shame that I lived in before. I don't, I don't have to be afraid that I'm not going to be good enough for God. I don't have to try to manage and control every area of my life because God's got me. He's got my kids. He's got my grandkids. He's got my great-grandkids that I haven't even seen yet. You got this. He's got this whole church. He's got this whole congregation. I don't even, as, even as one of your pastors, I don't have to stress about all y'all because God's got it. I just got to keep seeking him first. I mean, I, I ain't the smartest. I'm the most talented, but, but I, I can at least seek God. I could at least go after him. God, I want more of you. God, I need more of you. God, help me understand. You, you've given me a word that even as I keep reading it 40-something years later, I'm still learning stuff. God, I, I, need, more. I need more. And then he says, because God loves to throw in promises too, and he says in the last part of 33, and all these things will be given to you as well. We didn't even need that. Because I still would want to follow God even if I was thirsty and hungry and naked. But he said, no, I'm gonna, I got you. You keep seeking me. I'm going to take care of those things. Wow. Do you see how freeing that is? My life doesn't have to be consumed with trying to get money, trying to get happiness, trying to get peace in my own ways. I can trust my father, and he's going to take care. Now, I may not have everything I want, but I'll have everything I need. That's his promise. That's his promise. And then he, he just nails it down with one last point because he wants us to stay faithful. And it says in verse 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Somebody will say amen to that. You've got enough trouble. There's enough stuff to manage today. God has simplified life for us. He says, you don't even have to think about tomorrow. Now, that does, I'm not, there are some scriptures that give us, there's wisdom and planning and creating inheritance. I'm not, there's, there's some of that. But balance this with what he's saying. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. All I'm asking you to do is trust me today. Believe me today. Serve me today. Acknowledge me with your, with your money today. Be generous today. Give today. Serve today. Love today. Worship today. Bless my name today. Speak from your lips about me. Testify today. Don't worry today. Just Put your faith in me today. And I promise you, if every day that you call today, if you do that, he's with you. Because it's always today, if you haven't figured that out. It's always today. You can never live in tomorrow, so why do we let our minds live there? Today, he's with us. Psalm, Psalm 46 ends with the Lord Almighty, I forgot it now, it is with us. I've done messed it up. Let me go back there. It says, the Lord, yeah, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. No matter what trouble comes, because it will come. No matter how thirsty you feel, how hungry you may feel, physically, spiritually, relationally, the Lord God Almighty is with you. He's a personal God like he was to Jacob, and he is a fortress around you. Remember when I did that illustration last week, those of you who are here? His love, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his grace and mercy, they encircle you. He crowns you with righteousness. He, they're around you. That's what we need. When Daniel asked us to consider that during communion about when God says, what do you want from me? My first thought was, God, I just want you to be with me. Just don't leave me because as long as you're with me, I don't have to worry. 
I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to be good enough, do enough. You're with me. Father, we thank you this morning for your presence. We thank you, Jesus, that you spoke these words on earth to remind us, God, that we can trust you, that if we put our faith in you, God, and we seek you first, that you're there, you're with us, you're caring for us. And God, I pray for any here or anyone listening that doesn't understand the truth of how good you are. God, I pray that they would, their eyes would be open to see the fullness of your goodness, of your love. And that also that those who are questioning whether they're good enough would recognize that you love them with an everlasting love, that nothing that they've done separates them from your commitment to love them and to welcome them into your family. God, that you would remove every hindrance in our lives. And I pray that some of us would make that choice that we need to let go of focusing on things of money, of possession, status, security, comfort, whatever it may be, God, that today by the move of your spirit, you would show us those things in our lives and we would let them go. We would surrender them to you and we would commit to trusting you, commit to walking in faith we will let go even of the worry knowing that you have us and that you're with us in Jesus name if there's anyone here I'm going to give you a second chance today it's a good day because God is trying to move and Jesus is trying to speak to you if you're here and you have not made that choice if maybe now as we've been talking you realize man I really I need him I, there's, there is something missing I've been trying to figure out life on my own I've been trying to sustain myself and, and I'm on, if I'm honest I know that that's not enough there's like a hole there's something missing and there is because it's that relationship with God through Jesus that you need whether or not you fully understand that I want to give you a, an invitation because we got, we've got someone that would just love to help you understand that to talk with you be honest and real with you so I'm going to take another chance and just while everyone else is just, you're just praying over whatever God is speaking to you I'm going to just ask you to quickly raise your hand wherever you are it's no shame we've all been there we just do, do you want to understand more of what life with Jesus is like and what that does for you anyone anyone real quick alright I want to do a second thing I want to ask for those who want to pray knowing that you've been struggling a little bit with this maybe you recognize the reality that you, you, you just worry too much been a little too anxious maybe you've been a little too caught up in living for things and god is convicting you and i don't don't, it doesn't matter to me if it's big or small this is between you and god i just want you to stand to your feet as an act of surrender and say god today i want to let go of this and i want you to strengthen me increase my faith so that i can respond because i really want my life to, to be completely true when i say i want to seek you first God, I want you to be my king in every area. Even if you, like, I, God, I kind of, maybe I've given you 90-something percent, but I want it to be 100 percent. This is a struggle. It's real. God, you see us. You see your children. And I pray for those that are standing, for my brothers and my sisters, that God recognize that there's some part of them that's been distracted from being fully devoted, being caught up in other things, giving too much other things attention to other things. Lord, I pray today that just the sweeping presence of your spirit would move in this place. God, you would affirm and confirm your commitment to them. They would recognize how valuable they are, how you will protect them, how you will provide for them, how you will care for them. God, and I'm even asking for some tangible demonstrations of that. Show up in their lives in ways that are unexpected, in ways that are supernatural. God, to just to, to be a testimony to your goodness so that you would get glory, so that they could share testimony, not for their own benefit, but that others could see, man, look what God did. Look how faithful he was, how he provided for a physical need of healing, how he provided for a financial need of lack, how he provided for just something I was stressed and now I feel peace. God, just let there be testimonies amongst us that give you the glory while we receive the benefit. We thank you. All of this, God, is just... Jesus reminding us that God the Father loves us deeply, perfectly, and he's asking for us to completely trust him and live our lives fully dependent upon him. That's our heart's desire today, Lord. So we thank you.
thank you for these reminders. Thank you for the move of your spirit. And for further equipping us today to follow after you with all that we have. Be glorified in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. Yeah.